over Christmas, I was, I had the idea that I, I wanted to digitize my family's old photo albums so that everybody in the family could have them. And I spent, I, I tried downloading some software. I, I took photos of, of the photo albums and I was planning to um, try and crop out the, the, the pictures in them. And I, I know there's some software for that, but it was all really slow. And then I realized that I wrote some software. And if I actually draw around them, the photos in QPath, I know how to get them reshaped and make them all fit together and actually know how to manage those annotations and, and projects and everything. So in the end, I used QPath in order to digitize my family photo album so I could give it to, um, to everybody in the family at Christmas. So it's pretty versatile. You can apply it to lots of different things. I think I will use QPath for that. I wanted to do that also. I should so probably document the process. It's not obvious. Yeah, yeah. and post on YouTube. <laughs> cool. Learn about the newest digital pathology trends in science and industry. Meet the most interesting people in the niche and gain insights relevant to your own projects. Here is where pathology meets computer science. You are listening to the Digital Pathology Podcast with your host, Dr. Alexandra Zhurov. Welcome to the Digital Pathology Podcast. Today, my guest is Pete Bankhead. He is the author of QPath, an open source image analysis software. Welcome, Pete. Thank you. How are you today? Good, thanks. How are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for and joining the podcast for being my guest today. And let's start with the introduction. Tell about your background and how did you end up in the digital pathology field? Um, yeah, very much by, by accident. Um, so I find a lot of people in academia at the minute, they sort of mention feeling imposter syndrome, but I kind of do feel it is valid with my background. If I go back to the beginning, um, when I was at school, I did the minimum science that I could so like physics, chemistry, and, and biology squeezed into one subject. Not because I didn't like them, but just I wanted to do other stuff. So I did art, computing, and maths. But then for my degree, I went in a completely different direction and my undergraduate degrees in theology, um, which was... Okay, that is yeah, different. Turned out to be quite useful, though, because it, it really challenges you to think deeply and critically and evaluate arguments and change your opinion and, and things like that. So at the end of it, um, it done that to such an extent that I started a PhD in it, but I gave it up pretty quickly and then needed something else to do. Um, and so at that point, I started to think maybe medicine would have been good to go into, but it, it seemed too late. Um, and computer science became a bit more possible uh, with my background. So there was a conversion course at the University in Belfast for people with perhaps less than practical degrees to teach them skills in computer science. So I did that. It was sort of like an undergraduate squeezed into a year, so it was called a master's. Um, it ended up, I was doing a project in Munich as an Erasmus student, uh, and that's where I first was working on open source software for post-processing video lectures um, back in 2005, whenever um, the internet connections were maybe not so, so good or so fast. What did you um, use for that? And I used to work in Munich as well. Yeah, um, so I, I was writing it in Java. My supervisor mm -hmm. was Peter Siever, and he had developed this tele-teaching tool software, and then we needed um, something to post-process the lectures. So that was my project. Um, so at the end of that then, um, I returned to Belfast. It turned out that my, my uh, master's hadn't quite qualified me for a job in a company. I applied, I didn't get into it. So I applied for a PhD and I got accepted for that. And so I ended up in a biomedical sciences uh, research group, um, sort of seemingly by chance, um, in a physiology group looking at calcium signals and retinal arterioles. So my supervisors were all from biomedical sciences and they optimistically thought that they could teach me enough biology and lab skills and I would bring the computer science and I could work on their image analysis problems. We decided pretty quick that um, that was probably not going to be too good to have me in the lab. And so I spent the whole of the PhD focusing purely on image analysis. So digital pathology was actually by chance. Uh, yeah. Yes. Or did you have another choice? <laughs> um, I didn't know what it was whenever I started it. So whenever I, so after I finished the, the PhD, um, I went off to Heidelberg. Um, to work as a sort of somewhere between a postdoc and a staff scientist 
for three years there in a core microscopy facility where my job was to come up with sort of ways of analyzing images for the users of the microscopes. So then that's a load of different people with a load of different um, projects and scientific questions. And if I approached it with the sort of PhD mentality of three years later, you might get an algorithm um, that was not really going to please anyone. So that brought me more into the world of using open source and taking tools like MHJ and Fiji, adapting them, scripting them, writing plugins and so on, and starting to teach image analysis a lot more. But it was a three year contract. Whenever that ended, I applied for a couple of things and I thought, see, which, if any, happens first, and that happened to be digital pathology. So it brought me back to Belfast um, at the end of 2012. And all I really knew is that it involved images in some way. And so it seemed like it was going to be a, a continuity. But I've ended up staying in there longer than in any other field. So how did it lead you to Q paths? You, did, you didn't know, um, like you didn't know the digital pathology problems. You only knew that they had images. Yeah. And, you did Fiji for other bioimage analysis, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how QPath, how did it even happen? How did it originate this project? Um, so because I find in, in Heidelberg using the open source tools was a really effective way to work and then I could adapt it and I could still write, write code and develop my own algorithms, but I didn't have to write an entirely new user interface or, or anything like that. Um, I thought I would apply that in pathology and then I found that it didn't work. I mean, I couldn't even open a whole slide image in MHJ. And even, even today, that's not really possible to do very much with a whole slide image. Um, and so I spent the first couple of years, I wrote some horrible software in, in Python. I wrote some MHJ plugins that sort of did little, somewhat useful things. Um, but I just didn't have the tools to bring it all together. And I didn't really set out to create them. But, um, but one day, in, in my memory, I think it was just before the summer holidays, I had a little bit of a gap where I thought, OK, it's, it's too late to start something big. Um, um, but it's also, yeah, I have a little bit of space here, so I'll try it. I'll see what would happen if I start writing a whole slide viewer. It's not going to work. Um, but by the end of the day, it started to look like it might work. And then that kind of took over, um, well, actually, the next several years as I started to sort of piece the things together and to realize that if I started to build the tools myself that I wanted, then I had a lot more freedom to think about how to solve the problems in the way that I thought they could be solved specifically for the challenge of, of pathology. And having the creating the whole slide viewer was the first part of that, but it was inspired by these open source tools that I knew, but which didn't fit for pathology, trying to sort of yeah, rethink them and to recreate something new um, that would actually be designed for that from the beginning. So it was just a gap project because you didn't want to do something big, right? Yeah, I thought I've just had a day <laughs> and it's okay if I try something that doesn't work at least. You know, as long as I know it doesn't work by the end of the day, then um, I think it ruined the holiday from, from the memory of it. But... And we're going to talk in a second what uh, what QPath does, but let, let's start. Uh, what was the goal of your software? What, like... Um... Okay, you couldn't open um, images in ImageJ. There was not really anything, but why? So, so I was a postdoc there, so I was dependent on whatever my project happened to be. And in this case, it was for IHC analysis, um, and primarily of tissue microarrays. But kind of knew that it was going to um, turn into other images as well. And so when I was developing, I had a slight idea of what it would, would become. But because I didn't really know the field, I was always kind of working like one step ahead. So I thought, I've got tissue microarrays, I need to work with them. It was an option for me to use proprietary software, and we had access to a few, but I find that they didn't let me do what I wanted to be able to do, and I didn't really want to be restricted if I developed something. I could only sort of share the algorithm with other people who happened to have those licenses. And because I sort of knew how to write code and knew how to develop my own algorithms, I, I wanted to do it that way. Um, and so when I got the tissue microarrays, okay, I need to de-array them. So I wrote an algorithm for that that would identify the tissue spots. And then I think it was key 67 we were looking at first. And so I needed cell detection. And cell detection back in 2014, 2015 was still a big problem. I mean, it's still, even now, a bit of a problem. 
Um, and so I, I created my own, in that case, ImageJ plugin to try and do sales detection in a way that I thought tried to minimize the assumptions so that it should hopefully work kind of robustly. Um, and at that point, I thought it would be useful until the pathologist pointed out to me that we really only want to score K67 in the tumor cells, and so I need to get into machine learning. And so I started to build on something for machine learning. And, and then I started to learn about biomarkers that aren't, well, it's not nuclear staining. And started to hear about HER2 and even PDL1 and things like that. And I realized that if I just go one step ahead each time, this is never going to end. And every project is going to take forever. And I need to start trying to think a bit more broadly as to what are the individual um, tools that are needed and what are the common themes. And if I could try and spend time solving each one of these, then hopefully they could unify into something that can be adapted to lots of different problems. Um, initially, I didn't do that because firstly, I didn't think to do it. And secondly, because it seemed like it was a massive undertaking to do that, and which it, it would just never work. But eventually, I spent so long trying not to do that, I realized it was going to be much, it was much less efficient um, to avoid creating the tools than it would be to actually set about the big project. Mm -hmm. So I use QPath mostly as a slide viewer and annotation tool, minimal uh, amount of image analysis. Uh, obviously, it is mainly image analysis tool, although you said you started as a with the concept of a viewer. Um, who is this tool for now? And who um, is currently using it? So it's really, it's really for anyone who wants it. Um, so whenever I was, whenever I was Who might it, want it? Um, so I suppose the most obvious thing about it is that it's useful for pathology. Um, having path in the name um, kind of gets that, makes that evident. And so pathologists might want to use it. But I also created it because I needed the tools myself to develop algorithms because that's why lots of people use MSJ because you don't need to write it from scratch. You can write a plugin. And so with QPath, you can write an extension or you can write a script. So if I want to create an algorithm and share it with somebody, particularly with a pathologist in a user-friendly way, so they don't have to get into the code, then QPath gives me the tools to do that. But because my background was more in fluorescence microscopy and different types of images, I was still always thinking of those problems as well and the stuff that biologists are finding difficult in their images, where I thought maybe I could just, without telling anyone, try and solve some of those problems as well a little bit. Um, and so I started building some of the tools, thinking ahead for, say, fluorescence images, and which turns out multiplex to be quite important. But it's even not really restricted to that. So over um, at the minute in these strange times, uh, over Christmas, I was I had the idea that I, I wanted to digitize my family's old photo albums so that everybody in the family could have them. And I spent, I, I tried downloading some software. I, I took photos of, of the photo albums and I was planning to um, try and crop out the, the, the pictures in them. And I, I know there's some software for that, but it was all really slow. And then I realized that I wrote some software. And if I actually draw around them, the photos in QPath, I know how to get them reshaped and make them all fit together and actually know how to manage those annotations and, and projects and everything. So in the end, I used QPath in order to digitize my family photo album so I could give it to, um, to everybody in the family at Christmas. So it's pretty versatile. You can apply it to lots of different things. I think I will use QPath for that. <laughs> I wanted to do that also. I should so probably document the process. It's not obvious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and post on YouTube. <laughs> cool. So do you know how many people are using it? Uh, no, not really. I don't track users. I can't track users, and I don't even know entirely what's involved in that. I do know that it's been downloaded over 130,000 times. 130,000. Okay. So that's for all of the versions. And the latest version, it's over 20,000 times, and it grows by about four to 5,000 new downloads per month. Um, okay. I, <laughs> I started off trying to create a list of papers because I didn't want to overestimate how much it was used. So if, if I saw it cited in a paper, I would look it up and find out, did they actually use it or did they just mention it and reference it? And so there's about 470 to 500 papers at the minute that actually used QPath, um, not all of them citing it. And that's more than half of those are in 2020. Oh but my there's goodness. A, 
there's an extension from Google for the Google Cloud API, and there's a, a sort of a companion project, I think, from Fire, where it's like a Python library that links up with QPath. So I know it's also used in the industry as well. I know I can confirm that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. Wow, congratulations. So how did you know how to build this software? You you used other softwares and you said, you know, commercial was a little bit restrictive, but you didn't know, you didn't have any experience. How does one start doing this? And also you said that you know how to code, but software development is a different story than just knowing yeah. how to code. I want to know this story. Like, how did you know how to do it? I didn't know how to do it. And that's why I spent two years not doing it. If I'd known how to do it, I might've started it sooner. Although also, if I'd known how to do it, I would have known how much time it would take and I might have stopped sooner as well. So I'm not sure it could have gone either way. But, um, and with the commercial software, I really didn't actually use it very much because I knew that I didn't want to use it because I'd be locked into that. And I also didn't really want to be influenced by it. So I'd rather be influenced by the problems and the people that I spoke to and the problems they wanted to solve as opposed to anything else that I'd seen. But the one software that absolutely did influence me hugely is ImageJ. Mm -hmm. and so, Which is sure. open source as well. Yeah. Um, and so ImageJ was initially written by Wayne Rasband from NIH. And I think it was released around 1997. And it, it does. It looks a little dated now, um, but it's only a couple of megabytes in size. And just, I think last week or last month, um, Nature included it in their list of 10 computer codes that transform science because it's everywhere. The impact is massive for such a seemingly small thing. It's amazing what's been achieved with it. And there was a another project grew out of it called Fiji, which is like MHJ plus certain curated plugins that are particularly useful. Mm -hmm. And whenever I was in Heidelberg and I was using Fiji, I, I wrote a handbook to try and teach image analysis for biologists because I thought rather than trying to teach it. lots of individuals, if I can write a handbook, then it becomes useful. So that took me a lot deeper into the code and to figure out how it works. And there was developer mailing lists at the time I would read. Um, I remember Johannes Schindelin and Curtis Rudin um, were, were very active on there. And so I hadn't met them at that point. I didn't participate in the discussions and I didn't think I would ever do any open source software myself, but I just read them out of interest and I got to kind of see how they answered questions, how they thought about designing things. And it's only years later, I realized how much that influenced me. Um, I didn't know that in the uh, programming world, you also have like gurus and people that influence you. <laughs> Well, I don't think they tried to. They were just having the discussions about no, how to do really. it. But um, yeah, <laughs> it's all I guess very in, I guess I guess in every every discipline, I just you know there is the stereotype of a, a programmer that's not really too outgoing, um, which um, this stereotype has been broken for me by many programmers already. <laughs> but going back to Cuba. How are you addressing new improvements? So you said at the beginning you were just one step ahead. You didn't know the whole picture. Now, more or less, you know the picture and there are still new releases and you're still improving. How do you decide what to do next? Um, yeah, so it's... So I'm motivated really by whatever I think is going to be the most useful thing to do. And so because I created QPath not because I had a project to create new software, but because I had IHC analysis problems to solve, I was also a user of it. So I knew the things that I needed. You mentioned the annotation tools in it. So a lot of those are there are because I had to make tens of thousands of annotations myself. And so there's lots of um, sort of tricks and things that you can use and shortcuts that make it a lot easier. And they aren't all very, actually they're best documented on Twitter at the moment because I, I created a tutorial about them. Um, but all of those I exist. know them from YouTube. Ah, uh, yes. I think I described yes, some yes. of them, but I probably added more since then. But I added them because if something was annoying me in the software, then I would change it. If it's annoying another user, I might change it. But if I experience the annoyance myself, it's it's a bigger motivating factor. Um, and so a lot of the things that are planned for development in it are to do with projects that I'm working on. And so if you want something in it, collaborate with me is a good idea. Um, and so that I suffer 
the, the fact the future isn't there. But as well because I've been supporting it. I've had literally thousands of conversations with users and I get to see what comes up again and again. So I have an idea what, what people um, needed to do and what projects might be interesting. And I try and choose projects where I think if I solve this project, then I can think of about 20 more projects that are going to benefit from that. And so I prioritize according to those things. But the one other thing that I um, influences in my priorities is I think if there's a really good business case for something, and if there's like millions of dollars to be made in this application, I'm a lot less interested in it because I know other people will work on that. And there's no real need for it. So I'm much more interested in the kind of the, the niche projects or the very specific questions that people want to ask and try and work really broadly across a wide range of things. And I think that that means that you come up with new ideas and you have a broader range of tools when a new problem comes along, you can rely upon those as opposed to being very focused on say, tumor recognition in h &E or something that is, is incredibly common because that needs to work at a massive scale and there's people who do that better and they have the resources and the time and the and the skills to do it and that's that's not really as interesting for me i'm interested in a lot of things but i'm not as interested in that mm -hmm. so i think you said something super important when it bothers you you start changing it and i think this is uh, the experience well I don't have the experience to change the software, but because I work in an environment where I would give feedback to software developers on this kind of software, I kind of have this organic reaction when something sucks. Yeah. And I give a pretty strong feedback. Um, for the people that know where I come from, it's natural. Uh, but for others, I might maybe want to be a little bit more diplomatic. But uh, the thing that you said is you are using it. Uh, many software developers of the digital image analysis software are not really using this tool. So, you know, you give feedback as a user and uh, you don't see understanding in their eyes <laughs> because they don't use yeah. it, which is natural. But so that's why I am trying to uh, kind of establish this bridge between computer scientists and pathologists or life scientists who are using it. Um, I think but you kind of incorporate this. And I um, interviewed Andrew and he wrote HistoQC. He wrote HistoQC for himself because he had to do QC of HistoSlides like uh, you did with QPath, you wanted to use it. So this is fantastic. I think that's really important and it helps a lot. And it's one of the things that I really don't want to get away from that because I think I would get totally out of touch and I would end up solving what I think is important, but which really isn't. Um, and Whenever I was a whenever I was at Queens in Belfast, there was a, a pathologist that I worked with probably most closely is Morris Lockery. He had a he had a very charming way of telling me when stuff sucked, and so <laughs> um, I still speak with him a lot and meet with him a lot. But it, it helps to have somebody who they're positive enough about the project that they they care about it and they support it, but they're not going to pretend that something is good if it's not. Um, yeah, that, I think a person awesome. like this for uh, should be in any any digital image pathology software company. Yeah, I think you you need to build a bit of a relationship with them first, though, because if it's if you get hit with that, yeah, yeah, it might be hard. I mean, you should be nice to people, course. right? Yeah. <laughs> he somehow manages but, to do it. Exactly. So once on Twitter. I saw that you had to fight for keeping QPath open source. And this brings us to the open source question. First, um, why is QPath open source? And what is the philosophy behind it? You said a little bit about it, that you first you didn't want to be restricted or locked into something. Uh, other thing, you wanted to share it. Why is open source? And how did you learn open source also? Um, well, there was the, the master's project in Munich where I was developing open source, but to be honest, it just felt like a project that I needed to do. It was really interesting, but I had no, I didn't think very much more broadly about the fact it was open source or not, because I didn't really know um, enough. Um, but so whenever I was developing QPath, because I developed it in a project that wasn't to create open source software and it, it probably, it looked like there were probably more direct ways to do IAC analysis than to build something as new and big as this. And so it wasn't necessarily the, the obvious way to approach it, but in the end, I thought it was the right way to do it. And it was the only way in which I could do it. Um, then, 
yeah, that was slightly complicated things. And then we had to face, face the question as to whether it should be open source or not. I always wanted to be open source because, I mean, when I, I wrote this handbook for biologists, I made that openly available. I, I would rather maximize the usefulness of the stuff that I do. Um, and my impression was that if we didn't make it open source, it would be a bad commercial alternative because there's commercial software out there and there's no reason we'd have to lock this down. There's no reason why they need, anyone would need me to make another commercial platform. There's better ones out there. But I thought that open source is where there was really a gap and there was a need for it. And I, I think back to the two years I spent not having the tools to do the work that I wanted to do and being really inefficient and thinking, okay, I could publish a paper on ER and another paper on K67, but these are problems that there's so many papers on them, but they don't come with code. They don't come with software that you can actually use in general, unless it is a commercial platform. And you can't really build any standardization around that. And you have so many people who are doing really hard work. It might be fantastic, but kind of reinventing the wheel and so many postdocs and PhD students in the position that I was working quite inefficiently because the tools don't exist in an open way. And I thought if I could make these available, then that would save them a lot of time. They'd be able to work more effectively and they would also be able to share their algorithms in a way that becomes meaningful and other people can test them. Because if I read a paper and I see this method claims to be really good, um, I don't know if it is unless I've got the code. But if I can actually run it, then I can see, does it work in my images or does it not work in my images? And I think that that is a big important thing for advancing uh, advancing the field, the ability to share and to standardize. And as well to improve communications between image analysts and pathologists. Because I know that initially, whenever I would develop an analysis method, I would run it. I had the input image, I had a markup image, what's detected. And then the pathologist would look at it and say, well, it's got all of those cells wrong. And so you need to, to fix that. And then if I can only show them a month later what my new results are after all the changes I've made, that's not a good way to work. Whereas if I can show them in the software, we can annotate around it. If we can even retrain a new machine learning classifier in seconds, then we can really work efficiently and effectively together. And putting those tools in everybody's hands kind of raises the baseline for what everybody should be able to do because everyone has these tools. And if you're a researcher developing something, you build on top of it and you do something better. Mm -hmm. So who did who did you have to fight and how did you have to fight? <laughs> I yeah I, I need to be careful what I, I post on Twitter because I'm sure we all have um, different views on on how that experience was. But I suppose what I can say is that whenever you develop software at university, at least universities where I know, if you're a postdoc, you don't own it, so it's not your decision what happens with it. Mm -hmm. And so. If it hasn't been built into the grant that it's going to be open source, there's potentially a lot of people you need to convince. And that can be PIs, commercialization departments, um, funders, and so on. And so each has their own targets, responsibilities, values, goals. And for perfectly good reasons, they might not think that open source is the right thing to do. In my case, I thought that it was. Um, but even though I wanted it open source from the beginning, I ended up spending a couple of years developing and it still wasn't released and I wasn't sure how that was ever going to change. And so ultimately, the one thing I thought that I can do is I can leave. And so I ended up, I handed in my notice thinking that maybe I lost the last few years and it'll never become anything. But whenever I did that, then it was released open source. And so from my point of view, it was worth it because otherwise I, I yeah, I didn't put in all of the work of developing it for it just to, to become a commercial thing or else just to be an in-house tool. I wanted it to be open and I thought leaving was the only thing I could do. And so that was the way in which I, I yeah, tried to get it to happen. Unfortunately, it did. The addition to that is that because I couldn't publish it and make it open source, I also couldn't have much of a future in academia because no one had saw what I'd done. And so I ended up in a company then. And after I joined that, I was told that I couldn't actually do any open source. I couldn't continue it and support it when I was there. So I lost the next year when I couldn't update QPath at all. And so it was released. And then I could just look at the use increasing, but I couldn't actually update it. And so I left that job as well. 
um, to be unemployed for the next eight months or so, and travel around and I gave some talks and workshops to figure out what to do next and looking for the right atmosphere to be able to do the kind of open science that I wanted to do. And that's what eventually led me to, to Edinburgh. And I had lots of conversations with them first, just to make sure that I could do the open science there. Um, and so I started there with a new PI position, my first PI position in September 2018. And that's when QPath has really been a chance to revive it. But it's very different, I find now, as opposed to when I was before developing it sort of fairly closed and then had a very small number of users in the first uh, few weeks whenever I was still at university. And then I go back and suddenly there's, there's quite a few thousand users um, and I'm trying to update it and know that any change that I make is potentially quite disruptive for these users. It's a very different um, experience and it's quite, quite challenging. So now you are able to do QPath. This is part of your job now again. Yeah, and I make sure that if I'm applying for funding, I, I put in that it's going to be open source just to make sure that everyone knows from the start that, that's, that it's a key part of the reason for doing it. And then that, that helps just make sure that we don't have to... Um, figure that out later. So is there still like a threat that someday, like when you stop working on it, it's somebody's going to block this being open source? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think that's really possible now. Because so one thing I had to learn a lot about open source licenses, much more than I ever really wanted to. Um, but the fact that it is open source now means that I can't really be taken back. So even if I was to stop it, the code's all out there. Somebody else can take it and they can build on it. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's, so the way it's licensed, it kind of protects it. Yeah. And it helps mm -hmm. ensure that anything sort of built on it is also going to be open source, which is, uh, and it's one of the important things that there's a, there's a big difference between sort of freeware or open source. And it always frustrates me a little bit when I see people describe QPath as freeware or open source software as freeware, because the fact that you don't have to pay for it is only one small part of it. Um, the open source itself, the real benefit is these terms in which it's shared under, where you can see all of the source code, you can change it, even if you might not want to, or you might not be somebody who develops software yourself. In principle, you have access to all of that. And you can also, it makes it clear the terms that you can share it with others from. Um, and so that really is so much more than the software being free, because the software could be free, but you don't get the source code, and you don't have any of those rights. Um, but with open source, you have much more than, than free software. I love it. So basically, if I was working with some developer and didn't like something, I could ask, please change. Yeah. And they could change. This is fantastic. So you mentioned machine learning. Mm -hmm. So in what capacity is machine learning and artificial intelligence incorporated in QPath? And also, is it just machine learning or do you also have deep learning? Um, yeah, so, so QPath, so already back in 2015, I, I have remember having conversations about deep learning. It was clear that that's something that we would need to have in QPath and it was something that I wanted to be able to work on, um, because of various other things in life getting in the way that it's not officially there yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but from the beginning, QPath had conventional machine learning, like random forests, artificial neural networks and so on. Um, and basically that it kind of means that you've got things like cell classification in QPath. I would give it a few examples. I would, and then QPath would immediately train up say a cell classifier to identify tumor versus non-tumor cells. And that is almost instantaneous. And so you can apply that to a hundred thousand, maybe even a million cells within seconds. And if you're not happy with it, I'm going to do something else and it will reclassify all of your cells. And you can start to do that across multiple images and try and train up a classifier that's, that's quite uh, powerful. And so all of that's conventional machine learning and all of that existed from the start. Um, I've been thinking about deep learning for a long time. As it became more popular, uh, I certainly became convinced that it can do incredibly powerful things. But I also became convinced that on its own, you still need ways to sort of you can have deep learning and it, it sounds great, but you need to convert it into something meaningful, some kind of measurement. And if you want to say quantify numbers of cells or something, deep learning alone is not going to give you that. Or maybe you want to measure something like distributions of cells, distance between them. If you want to get, look at tumor margins and so on, you need so much more as well as the deep learning component. 
and possibly in some times you can even replace the deep learning with conventional techniques and they'll do almost as well. And so I thought, okay, if I go straight into deep learning early and try and get that into QPath, it's going to look a lot more modern and fashionable and up to date, and maybe that'll be more attractive, but it's not going to solve nearly as many problems as if I think of what, through these thousands of conversations with users, I know what people need to do. And most projects, that's not yet deep learning. If deep learning was there, it would help. But if you have deep learning and nothing else, you haven't solved the problem. And so I've worked mostly on the things around it, like being able to represent your million cells, classify them one way or another, handle multiplexed images, look at distance metrics and all of this kind of stuff. So all of the kind of infrastructure. I even have a pixel classifier in there that I can just annotate a few regions and based upon textures and colors, QPath will then start to generate predictions from them live across your image. And all of it is designed in such a way that at some point, hopefully this year, you can just slot deep learning instead. And then suddenly you have deep learning and everything else. Um, and so I tried to do it in such a way that deep learning would be fun when it arrives, but when it arrives, you actually have the other stuff already in place that you can rely upon. And so, uh, yeah, that was a long way of saying it doesn't yet have deep learning, although actually um, I can add to that. Immediately before um, lockdown, I was at a conference in, uh, in Bordeaux and I met Martin Weigert, who's developed this uh, along with uh, Uwe Schmidt, I think, um, a fantastic nuclear segmentation algorithm called Stardust. And I liked it so much that I developed a way to run it through QPath whenever I got back. Um, so if you want to get a deep learning based cell segmentation in QPath, there's instructions online for how you can do that. Um, so that's the first official example. Uh, there's lots of unofficial examples when I use deep learning in it, but they're not publicly advertised or accessible yet. Mm -hmm. you, I kind of experienced similar thing, like you say, deep learning. There is a lot of hype and it's powerful, but I only see it powerful for um segmentation and detection but not really i always end up asking myself okay what are going to be my endpoints and when you decide for your endpoints it's going to be okay this you have to subtract even though you already trained and detected uh, the cells that are that distance have to go so you end up kind of setting thresholds and doing the classical sorting through your data it's not anymore for detection i think uh, deep learning at least for me as a pathologist for detection is a revolution yeah I don't have to set any thresholds. I don't have to like balance between different characteristics. Okay, which one do I optimize for? No, I take my mouse, pen or whatever I draw and it trains on what I draw. But downstream, I still have to think, okay, what am I going to do with this data? And it comes to setting threshold in a different way. Yeah. Numbers, anyway. Mm -hmm. So this is maybe going a little bit away from pathology back to my old fluorescence days, but whenever you've got a fluorescence image, there's certain things you, you kind of know if it's from a microscope, like there's the point spread function of the microscope, the noise follows a Poisson distribution, you might have out of focus light and you need to subtract. There's all of these principles to do with where the image comes from. If you want to quantitatively analyze it, analyze it you kind of need to know it. And you can't really take a shortcut, ignore all of that years of stuff to get deep learning and actually expect that you potentially lose a lot and you potentially get things pretty badly wrong. In pathology, it would be perhaps stain separation with color deconvolution. If you ignore all of the principles, there is a chance that eventually that leads somewhere quite bad. So it helps to have the combination of this fantastically powerful tool of deep learning, but also still keep in mind that the image comes from somewhere. The pixel values mean something. and They're not just these arbitrary numbers that somehow you find a pattern in, but they do mean something and you need to sort of keep that in mind and try and always relate mm -hmm. back to it and not just trust the results. I think this is becoming a trend in the industry as well. Many companies come from the classical machine learning, classical image analysis and computer vision, and they are now adding deep learning on top of that. Others just start with deep learning, but all the ones that have been in the market a little bit longer, they already have the non-deep learning tool and they're adding this on top of that. So if I wanted to learn QPath, I know that there are some tutorials on YouTube. I took them for at least for annotations. 
I know there is a user manual on GitHub and that you were giving classes before, like live lectures. What are you doing now in the COVID times? How do you spread the word and how do you teach people Cuba? Um, yes. So, so, yeah, there's some, some tutorials online that I, I recorded eventually at a time. The documentation is no longer on GitHub. It's on Read the Docs. It's completely oh, rewritten okay. and updated for the latest version. Um, but what, what these COVID times have taught me is I was saying yes to a lot of stuff. I was teaching. I was going around a lot of places speaking about it. And not having the chance to do that has made me focus a little bit more on the software and the tools and to what's perhaps a more effective way to do it. And so increasingly, if I'm going to create a tutorial, I'll try and make it as useful as possible. And so I will put it online. Um, what I, I do think there's definitely a benefit from in-person teaching, but now that I have tried to establish a research group and I've got a couple of people working in it, I need to think, how am I going to keep them? Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that there may in the future be like in-person training in Edinburgh. I'd be very interested to know what the interest is on that. But as opposed to, I go lots of places and I, I teach all these free workshops. Um, I need to start to try and think of how can I fit this in so that it's as useful as possible and helps as many people as possible. And that now, now I start to have to think about, yeah, how it can be self-supporting. So. Yeah, I, I'm interested in, in feedback as to what people would like in that, that kind of regard. Um, there is one online workshop, the entire workshop from La Jolla Institute, um, where I taught it just before lockdown again, and they had put the entire thing online. So that's all on YouTube as well. But and it's months, available. Can we share yeah. with the listeners the link to this? Uh, yes, yeah, so and is a you put YouTube channel, and I, I link to, to all it's the things the, there. Oh, okay, this workshop. great. I will definitely... And link that also in the show notes. So a couple of practical questions. You mentioned uh, you come from the IF world. Is our IF images, immunofluorescent images, supported in QPath? Uh, yeah, they always they always were from the from the start, uh, more or less. That was one of those things that I had to sort of <laughs> because I had no projects that worked on it. I had to sort of try and sneakily make it work um, without anyone really paying attention to it. But the so whenever I left Queens, the latest version was 0.1.2, and that was the up-to-date one for, for a few years. Now we're at 0.2.3. I was very conservative with my version numbers, which I, I now start to regret. Um, but the multiplex tools have improved a lot. So I can, for example, I've opened a, a maybe image with 44 different channels, and I can view them all simultaneously in QPath. And there's even a little channel viewer that I can now move my mouse over and see them all side by side. So it's a lot easier to interpret. Again, because I find like multiplexed images, even with two or three channels, quite hard to interpret. Um, the shortcuts in QPath that I can toggle the channel on or off. I just type the number of the channel and then that will immediately toggle the on or off. And it's a lot easier to see what's within the image. There's this multi-channel viewer, this cell detection should work as well as it ever works, uh, which is variable. Um, but it will also measure all of your channels, your multiplexed image, and you can train up machine learning classifiers one marker at a time and then apply them sequentially in order to get whether a cell is positive for various different markers um, and then visualize all of that information. So all of that exists at the moment. Mm -hmm. Next question, is exporting annotations an option? And uh, I know it is because I Google it, but I kind of... Uh, would look forward something like in Aperio image scope where they are exported automatically and you can send them via email. I did not find that in QPath. Is this an option? Um, not yet, but so, so Melvin was the first person ever employed. Whenever I, I joined Edinburgh, I got a, a, a small grant um, from the University of Stoke Wealth and Trust and that brought Malcolm up, uh, Melvin on board. And so he's actually working on adding that as a menu, uh, as a menu item. So the trouble with exporting annotations is that it means something different for everybody. So in some cases, it might be like a labeled image where your image, where the pixel values correspond to what you're looking at. And that's what machine learning and deep learning people usually want. For some people, it can be the contours, um, like the, the coordinates of the, the, uh, yeah, the boundaries. And so there's a different representation for that. And then it can depend, are your units in pixels or, or micrometers 
where is the origin the top left of the image or elsewhere and so there's so many different things in there um so what i've tried to do in qpath is to adopt an open standard as far as i know the xml that image scope will give you is not an open standard um i would support it in qpath if it was actually i i tried to ask um whether or not i could support it in qpath but i never got an answer and so if it's not an open standard I'm not going to do something that's going to annoy a company with a, a file format, mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll just stay away from it. Um, but yeah, so QPath didn't let you export annotations because I was trying to figure out what would be the right format in order to promote these kind of open standards and make it possible to exchange information. And currently, the way around that is that you can, there are scripting recipes in QPath for any type of export you might want. You just take, take the one that you want, adapt it, and you can export it in a totally, um, yeah, uh, flexible way but if you want a command in the menu and um, melvin will bring mm -hmm. that to you um, for the next version okay so uh, you would need to know some coding to do that or just to copy and paste for most of it i um, can do copy and paste yeah. <laughs> and there's a forum so if you run it and it doesn't work you can ask in the forum and there's well over oh. a thousand discussions on the forum already so i will link the forum as well in the show notes and um, next practical question can you turn image analysis results into annotations and use them for deep learning training so let's say i do the chi 67 segmentation and it looks nice and i want this to be my annotations for deep learning how do i do that so that's that's going to be one of those annotation export recipes so um what I've, i tried to do with qpath is um it's really easy to add a lot of extra buttons to the user interface and then it becomes intimidating and confusing. So I try to be relatively selective about the stuff that's there. Um, and if anything seems highly customized, it's all through a script and there's loads of scripts that exist. Um, I know a lot of people who don't write code don't like the sound of scripts. Um, going back to Morris, the pathologist that I know I I described a script to him once and he said, oh, that's like a macro. Macro is fine. So he was fine with the macro, but if I call it a script. So if it helps, think of it as a macro. And a lot of them you can copy and paste the one that you want. But the reason that it exists is because normally it's specialist and niche enough that adding it, adding a button to do that is, I think, probably going to confuse people more than help them. But if it turns out that everybody wants the same sort, then there will be a button in a future version. Mm -hmm. Great. So what was your greatest challenge? Um, uh, this, you probably had plenty, but like one that you would have to choose. So there's a, a really good book that I read recently from uh, Nadia Ekpal called uh, Working in Public, The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software. And so she had, she had a really nice point in it, kind of about how software is viewed quite differently. So. For example, if, if I was making a chair and I, if I had one customer for my chair, then that's fine. If I have a million customers, that's going to take a lot of more work and a lot more resources to create a lot more chairs. But if I make software and I share it with one person, then that's fine. Um, but if I upload it and a million people download it, it doesn't really cost anymore. Um, there's no more. It's pretty much negligible. So it, it seems like it scales really a lot. But she pointed out in her book that actually the finite resource becomes the time of the maintainers and the people who develop it. Because suddenly if you have a lot of people using something, they might each have maybe a question or two, um, but that really starts to add up at these kind of skills. And so you can think that because it's open source, so the community looks after it. But with most open source projects, it really is only a couple of people you're really at the center of the of the storm, um, and so that becomes quite quite a challenge to to manage. Um, but it, I mean, it's also worth it because without any users, the entire thing is pointless. But I find that um, there's different ways to engage with an open source project. You can go, you can ask your questions, you can leave. That's fine, or you can just not ask your questions at all. Um, but it's really nice whenever I start to see. People who have used the software, they might ask some questions, but then they come back and they start answering questions for other people and helping one another out and exchanging ideas. And that's that's the exciting part for me. It doesn't happen an awful lot yet, but there's definitely some people who really do that. And that's one of the best ways to contribute and support an open source project. 
it's often thought that if you want to support it, you have to write code. Um, actually, my heart sinks whenever I see someone want to change the code in QPath, because I think, I like the writing the code. And that means that for the next few hours, I need to review it and think through the implications and think, how is this going to affect like a thousand other users on different projects if I integrate this change? So writing code isn't the most effective way to help. The most effective way to help is to engage with the project, help other users, um, and so on. And so it's trying to create that kind of community and ways of supporting this sustainably uh, is, is the biggest challenge. And if I can add, there's, there's one thing specific to academia, I think, about this, is that none of this is really valued um, in academia, and that's a bit of a problem. Um, because I, I kind of get the sense that software isn't viewed as being research. And actually, if I develop the machine learning algorithms, the cell detection algorithms that are in QPath at the minute, and I just publish them as papers with no software, that would be research. No one would use them, but it would be research. But if I do 10 times as much work, turn it into software, put it out there, support it, and so on, then it becomes software. So you're not really a researcher, you're a software developer, and that's a whole different funding. It's hard to get a job and so on. So it seems to actively disincentivize people actually sharing their stuff. And Andrew Janowick, actually, you mentioned his, his podcast, he described that the worst thing that can happen with open source is that nobody uses it. But I would argue that actually the worst thing is more that um, people use it and they find bugs and that's embarrassing. And maybe they find bugs that undermine your results and you need to retract your paper or maybe they demand support and it takes all of your time. There's so many worse things can happen than people, <laughs> people not using it. And so I think there's, open source is scary. Um, it makes you feel really exposed and it's stressful and it's time consuming. And I think that, that the way academia is working at the minute, it makes it harder. And that means that it's harder to create the tools and to support the tools that other people in academia and in research actually want. And so that's the challenge is kind of the culture of the thing, being able to cope with a project, keep it going, make it sustainable, um, and hopefully, uh, yeah, as useful as possible. Sorry, that was a long so, <laughs> academia values publications and citations, right? So yeah. um, citations, I assume, help bring this project forward. So here, a big uh, call for action to everybody who's listening. If you're using for any of your research, please cite. And I think there are instructions on the website uh, how to exactly cite or which paper to cite. And I'm going to also include that in my show notes. Thank you. Pete. What are the next steps in your research? Any new exciting projects or is it new exciting things within QPath? You're basically employed by QPath wherever you go. Um, yeah, I'm not. So for me, QPath is only ever a means to an end. Um, and so I hope it'll be useful. Um, yeah, occasionally I, I hear from companies and they suggest, oh, you can do this and then you'll get more users. And I think, I don't want more users. I want it to be as useful as possible. And that can be a small number of users who do fantastic things with it, or it can be a large number of users who um, maybe don't do fantastic things with it. I would much rather have the, the smaller number who, who use it as usefully as possible. And so the next steps for me are to try and make it sustainable because I think there's a lot more potential and it's limited at the minute by time. And the, we're a tiny group. There's there's two people. Their funding runs out this year, and it's me, and so we're a little bit stuck. And I I struggle with this software research um, tension that everything I have to do is collaborative because nobody really wants a um, the computer scientist applying for pathology grant because on their own because that's not I don't know it. Um, and so it's finding the collaborations and the research projects and having it recognized that we can if we work together. We not only try and solve the AI analysis problem, but we also then have an open source platform that we integrate it into so that all other groups who care get the benefits of it. And I'm trying to share that message with more people so that we collaborate more and we start to be able to build those relationships that make it possible. At the minute, I've got a lot of projects where I'm usually the bottleneck um, because they're all sort of side projects for specific applications, but they're feeding into the next versions of the software. I don't want to say too much about individual ones because it's always, it's always someone else's images and I don't want them to um, mm -hmm. be annoyed. But, but yeah, there's sort of deep learning coming. There's lots of interesting research projects and it's the challenge is to get it all together and to make sure it's as useful as possible.
Mm-hmm. The sustainability, I get that uh, was a joke that you're employed by QPath. If you make it sustainable, you can leave this job <laughs> and your mission is going to be is going to be fulfilled at least. Uh, yeah, I'd be quite yeah. happy if if, uh, if I can stay in academia and, and maybe if somebody creates something that the services you need, then I'll do something else other than QPath. It doesn't have to be QPath. But at the minute, I think it, there's something that it can probably offer there's a lot more that it can offer and i would like to to keep it going um and yeah there's a chance that yeah i, I build a group and then they all become better at doing it than i am and then i become make myself useless and i can do something else instead but at the minute i'm, I'm still quite in the middle of it thank you so much thank you so much for coming and talking about it and thank you so much for cupad i mean it's fantastic i love it I only use it in a limited capacity, but you know what? I'm going to learn to use more. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks very much. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. And take care. Thanks for listening. For more great digital pathology resources, visit the Digital Pathology Place website and subscribe to our newsletter on digitalpathologyplace.com. After subscribing, you will get access to the free Digital Pathology Crash Course, which will help you start working on your digital pathology projects immediately. Talk to you in the next episode.